Good morning. So um, before I get started, I, I, I want to thank everyone for coming. This is a very special moment for me. Um, I see new faces. I see friends, extended family. So thank you for coming. Um, in the tradition of color and ethnicity, um, I'd like to open up by giving thanks to the ancestors and to, because I stand on their shoulders in all my work. I also want to take a moment and actually have some nice alkaline water here. And for a moment, I'm just going to pour a libation. And that's for the ancestors as well, because they guide me in all my work. Um, years ago, um, <clears throat> I was still living in New York, and I used to come down a lot. I started coming down to Georgetown to my maternal grandmother when I was about four years old. And several cousins got shipped to grandma every summer faithfully. It gave all the siblings up north who had migrated an opportunity to be adults with our children. And it gave us a time with our grandmothers. And <clears throat> out of all those cousins, I was the one that continued to come back even as an, a young adult. The others lost interest, didn't have a desire. Um, but there was something that kept wanting me to come back. And um, I had heard um, about the history of my family and that my grandfather had been um, killed in a hunting accident. And, you know, we all have stories, and stories are, are what, what give us and make us who we are. We all have stories. We all have narratives and information to move forward um, as we, you know, go through our journey here. So um, after I go through what I have today, you'll probably understand more about that journey and, and how I've kind of come full circle. Um, as a young girl doing Polaroid photography with my dad, who was from Charleston, South Carolina, and again, my mother, who was from Georgetown. So um, two questions came up. Um, one I'd like to address now. There was a question before we started. What is the difference, if any, between Gullah and Geechee? There is no difference. The words are interchangeable. Generally, um, the, <clears throat> the government has now officially claimed that the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor extends from Jacksonville, North Carolina, to Jacksonville, Florida, from the coast into who are 100 miles inland. And any people that you find there of African descent are Gullah people. There was a time that Gullah people did not want to be called Gullah or Geechee. It was considered a derogatory name. Those rice-eating, backwater, saltwater Geechees is what a lot of people refer to my ancestors. And you know, they had a different twang and talk. And so when they migrated up north, um, when someone was from Charleston, you really knew. You really knew because you could hear their twang. And I remember my grandmother's neighbor, Miss Charlotte. Miss Charlotte sounded like she had just stepped off a boat from Jamaica. And I can remember she had these large hands, and she was such a strong woman. And you know, those are the kind of images that that I remember. You know, as a little person coming down and thinking that, wow, my grandmother's house is so big. But then, when I moved in 1997 from Harlem to that house, it's a pretty tiny house, and it was like my grandfather was really a small person. I mean, these ceilings are kind of low and stuff, so. But anyway, that's what you know gives, gives my initial work. So I'm going to take a sip and I'm going to get started. Did you hear me gulp? <laughs> OK, so I want to begin by um, showing you an image. This actually are my ancestors. The, the woman in the middle is my, my Lucy. <clears throat> my Lucy Shaw Smalls, and my Lucy was my great-grandmother's sister. This is the oldest photograph that, that I have in my possession of my family, and I had come down one year, and um, in my grandmother's um, upstairs room, there was actually this photograph, and it was a large photograph, like 16 by 20, but it was fading. So I, I brought it back with me to New York, and I left it at my mother's house for safe, safekeeping. 
So um, my mother passed away, God rest her soul, um, Edna May King. She passed away in 1991. And my family, you know, when you, you're going through your possessions and people are letting go and stuff and everything, um, my aunts had started cleaning and I was like, um, did you see a, uh, an envelope, a big, large envelope? And they're like, no, I think, I think we threw that thing out. There was nothing in there. I said, like, oh my God. So I run downstairs and in the back alley with the trash, there's the photograph. So, you know, those are the kind of things that happen that, that gives you, the universe always gives us signals in terms of what we're supposed to be, what our life calling is. So that was one of them again. So what I did was after that, I made sure to make a photograph and get a copy negative so that I could ha have this, this picture because it, it says a lot, you know, it, it really says a lot. Um, the other thing that was interesting is that <coughs> Carrie um, was the first of the family to migrate to Harlem, New York, and she was gainfully employed as a dressmaker and a beautician. So that, that's like what I want to open with. The other thing I want to tell you is that my work in Barbados, um, I'm particularly drawn to it, not necessarily because I'm Beijing, I don't know yet, but there's something that's pulling my spirit there. And we know that in 1670, eight British Lord proprietors came to Charleston, at the time it was called the Carolinas, and um, six of them came from Barbados. And with them, they brought enslaved Africans. And my work focuses on finding out who those enslaved people were and what artisanal skills they brought. In other words, what cultural capital to, did they bring? Because as artisans, there was a lot to be achieved if you had a skill. It puts you in a whole nother ballpark in terms of economic gain. So there's always been an interest in terms of um, people from other places, um, Europeans in particular, um, wanting to know more about our culture. When I say our culture, I mean, for example, when the British first saw Africans and how they described you know, in the literature what we looked like from the shape of our lips to the curves in our bodies. Um, and they kept awesome records about us. They were really, really studying and researching who we were as African descended people. And you know, this whole question of agency and authority um, is something that I, I'm constantly looking at in terms of who looks at our work and how it's appropriated or misappropriated based on you know, who's doing it and so forth. So we have a lot of authorities historically that have looked at the Gullah culture and um, it continues, and that's a conversation we'll do, talk at an, about it another time. But this one in particular I wanted to share with you because um, St. James Parish in Goose Creek was one of the initial um, parishes that was formed by those, those British men that came from Barbados. And the Goose Creek men, as they were known, um, included people like Robert Daniel, who Daniel Island was named after, and <coughs> excuse me, Sir John Yeamans, um, and to this day, I mean, I know some Yemen's from Georgetown, South Carolina. Um, I've been doing um, research in the archives in Barbados, and, and they're rich archives. They tell you so much about these families, but also about the people that they owned and, you know, what they did for them. Um, this area is also interesting because there are, um, at the Ronto Plantation, there are indigo vats that have been put on a National Historic Landmark. Um, on record because in the 1740s they were doing they were making indigo and indigo became a prime um, crop for economic game in America and Defusky Island in the 1750s to the 70, 1770s was doing quite well growing indigo and importing it. If anybody has ever seen Daughters of the Dust, um, there's some rich imagery about the whole indigo culture. Um, this is just, um, an, again, another thing by, that Yeomans put out, and I put it here because I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of digital imaging and how we can use these digital images for education. Um, 
there are so many records that aren't available to us because they're still locked away in somebody's archive. And you know, accessibility becomes so important, and that's why digital humanities is such an important field. And as a cultural heritage informaticist, that's what I do. You know, I'm interested in getting images so that everybody can see it, not just the elite people that can afford to go to an archive. So I look at things like material culture, and I'm showing you these. You may ask, well, why is she showing us these things from Barbados? I thought I was here to learn about Goa. Well, it's important because when we think about material culture, we can look at things like wattle and daub in terms of <coughs> um, making houses. So wattle and daub was this um, repurposed way of creating out of sugar cane. The roofs are made out of thatches from sugar cane, coral limestone, and wattle and daub. And the Ashanti were doing wattle and daub over 6,000 years ago. Um, Native Americans use wattle and daub. The Irish use wattle and daub. However, the wattle and daub houses tended to be more inland, although um, they have been known to see some also in Savannah, which is you know, a coastal city. These are what they call chat chattel houses in Barbados. And th this, is a, this is a current standing house. And the interesting thing about them is that they were made um, very similar to our slave cabins in terms of the interior. And as people made more money, they extended it. So they added on rooms, and it went, it went back. And that's how they, they incre increased it you know, for size and so forth. Of course, this is an old one with a tin roof. And here's a, a more modern one. This is actually a, a, a rum shop. And there are a lot of rum shops in Barbados. Any time of the day, if you want some Bayesian rum, they're available. And this is on a rainy day. We're in a bus, so that's why it looks like that. And then this is a former slave cabin down on Edisto Island. So if you see the similarities. This is current Barbadian architecture. And some of the things that's interesting about this is this whole idea of fretting. The fretting is the, the interior. Let's see if I can. Ah, these, are, these are what we call frets. And these are, these are a lot of times, they are, they're designed and then they're created and, and, so, and so, soared and you know, put up. And it's an amazing process, which is so old. Um, the archives is in a building that used to be the leprosy hospital in Barbados. And there's fretting even on that building. But interesting, look at the colors. I want you to take a look at the colors, because the colors are really pastel and kind of island-like. And when you think about Rainbow Row in Charleston, you can see, again, how the transfer transference has taken place, whether it be the visuals and you know, how people dress, how people create their homes, and so forth. Um, a lot of, lot of um, cross-cultural um, behavior, I guess I can say. So when we think about heading goods, so, so what do I mean by heading goods? OK, so this is an old image from um, a, a stone drawing from 1835. It was done in London. And um, it's views of island the island in Barbados. And look at the woman. She's carrying stuff on her head. Also, what's really interesting is the pottery. Pottery is very important in, in Barbados, as here in South Carolina, Charleston and Edgefield, South Carolina. You have Dan the Potter. If anybody's familiar with Dan the Potter from Edgefield, um, they have a great children's book about Dan. So this whole idea of heading goods, we still have, I have friends today. My friend from um, the old village in Mount Pleasant Miss Virginia told me that she's 83, and she told me that her grandmother always headed her goods. And she, she could carry so many things on her head while she was also holding her hand, and not anything dropped at all. So it, you know, it created posture and all kinds of wonderful things. So these are mobby, mobby vendors. Mobby is a drink made out of a bark of the mobby tree. Just like we have sassafras here, sassafras tea, well, they make mobby. And it's fermented, and these women actually carry the mobby tins on their heads and actually pour, pour it from their head. An amazing feat. Okay, And um, there's a museum in the Scotland district where uh, one woman was doing this up until she was almost 90 years old. 
Then we come to Charleston and we look at the vegetable vendors and the, or the hucksters. Hucksters and vegetable vendors were in both places. To this day, we have the market in Charleston, um, a little different, but you know, similar in a lot of ways. Um, but look at the, the, again, just the, the posture, the clothing, and so forth. At one point, the government was so threatened that they decided that they had to institute a license to huckster. So that was their way of keeping control because people were getting, women in particular, were getting too empowered, having, get, getting too much money because they were selling, they were independent. Um, they could grow, grow things, you know, on the plantation or a nearby farm, then go into the city and sell it. And so there had to be some sort of way of, of control that took place. Look at these women. This is in South America, and I put these women in because they too are heading goods. But notice the colors, right? And I really want, I want you to consider and think about transference of color. So for example, the Africans, if you were to go to Africa today, the colors are amazing. They're dark and rich and brilliant, and they're not blue and gray or croca sack, which is burlap, or they're not, you know, indigo, which is like a darker blue. They're vibrant colors. Well, one of the things and one of the ways, once again, that, that Africans were controlled is by taking away what Africans wore. They were put into, you know, uniforms, working uniforms, something that was drab and would not draw attention, and it would put you in a more, um, what will I say, a more or a sightly view. In other words, you wouldn't draw attention. The same thing when it came to covering one head, one's head. Women at one point had, oh, the exotic hair that was done in Africa. And they made a law in Barbados that women had to cover their hair, particularly women of color, whether they be black or, quote, colored women who were mulatto women. They had to keep their hair covered because they did not want to be threatened. The women, the white women, did not want to be threatened by their men being attracted to these, quote, exotic women of color. So the law went into effect that women had to cover their hair. So when talking about material culture, um, I also, um, I want you to look at this. This is grass dolls. And I, and I bought, put this in particularly because I'm, I want to pay respect to my, my, my friend and my dear sister, my, my beloved who passed away in December, Bunny Rodriguez from Georgetown, South Carolina. And Bunny made these grass dolls. This is how Bunny learned how to braid hair as a child. They took grass and they put it on a stick and they braided it. And that's how little girls learn how to braid. And I wanted to put it in there because when we look at the, the photographs today while you're in the gallery, there's some images in there of young girls with dolls and they're, they're teaching themselves how to, quote, do hair or braid. So again, repurpose grass. One thing that I forgot to bring today is a blade of grass. When I was a little girl, my mother taught me how to blow grass. And I would encourage, does anybody know how to blow grass? Raise your hand if you know how to blow grass. Look around you, folks. These people know how to blow grass, OK? So basically what it is is you take a blade of glass, you put it between your, your thumbs, and you blow it, and it sounds like a duck. It's an amazing natural toy. So try it. You'll like it. So this whole idea of repurpose, this, this photograph, you can't really tell. It's not doing it justice. But um, I was walking through Barbados, and I looked up. And this is the wall that surrounds the archives. And the archives wall, there's all this broken glass embedded on the top of the wall. So what, why do you think that is? Anybody? Right, so it's an alternative to barbed wire. OK, it's beautiful when the, when the sun is shining through the glass. It's, it's beautiful. And it also keeps people from going in. Um, and it's economical. You know, again, making ways out of no ways. And whether it be Gullah or whether it be European or whomever, we all, it's a universal thing that we took what we had and we made the best of what we had. It's not just Gullah, you know, it's just, it's universal. 
So um, Spitestown is a very interesting place in Barbados, but this is where I want to talk a little bit about my own creative process and look at how we begin to realize what we see all around us as a reflection of the universe's phenomenal beauty. So I'm standing in Spitestown and I'm looking at the beautiful flowers and I'm like, wow, isn't that amazing? And these flowers are everywhere. And then I say, oh my goodness, my eye takes a, a, a full view, a detail, and then all of a sudden I'm standing there and I look and behold, across the street, look at the bakery. Does the bakery not match the nature? Does the bakery not reflect what we see around us. And I'm getting chili bumps as I'm describing it. So this is my creative process. This is how I do photography. This is how I make my art. You know, I see and I create. And um, then we go inside the bakery and wow, lead, pep, lead, lead pipe, dollar bread, and salt fish patty. So this is the menu in the PRC bakery. And this kind of gives you an idea of what they have in here. But what I noticed later was, look, in, look over the, the man in the doorway, look what it says over his head. Does anybody see that? It says Fox. It says Fox. I thought that was pretty interesting. So I want to talk about a little bit about funerary customs. And she mentioned digital thanatology. Do you remember that? Does anybody know what that is? Thanatology is the scientific study of death. Okay. So some people say, oh my God, that's so gory. And how, how can you do work in cemeteries? And oh, and or how can you, I have a friend here, two, a couple of my friends here, we go over to the Palmer Mortuary because Miss Lauren has a, a meeting there every month from jazz bands to whomever, poets and all that. And I have people that have said to me, how can you go over there to that undertaker place and sit in that auditorium? Listen, this is not the dead that's going to hurt you. The people in the cemeteries, they're not going to hurt us, you know? But anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> so anyway, so funerary customs, and, and, and I, I talk about this because I'm doing a lot of work with young people around um, funeral practices. And um, what we know about the Gullahs is that they were often places, um, they were done in, funerals took place in wooded areas, usually by water. Um, so you know, again, the, the connection to the natural elements, okay? Uh, this is a, a painting that was done by Antrobus in 18, from 1837, um, is when he was born. He died in 1907, and this is in a New Orleans collection. But again, it's a plantation burial. This is a Jamaican image, and the Baptist missionary that wrote about this in 1840 says, these heathen practices and funerals, what is this? Again, he saw it as heathen. They saw it as they were doing what they do. You know, so again, we, you know, we can't impose what we believe on other cultures and vice versa because we don't want anybody imposing on us. Here's an old time midnight funeral. And um, I want to, I can't, I don't have the time to talk about it, but I do want to mention the Bakongo Four Moments of the Sun. And the Gullah people are very much connected to the, the Bakongo tribe. And um, Ferris Thompson writes about, in his book, um, Flash of the Spirit, talks about the four moments of the sun. And basically, it says that um, at different times of the day, different energies are, are in effect, in other words. So um, a lot of times, funerals were done at midnight or at nighttime for a number of reasons. Sometimes because you couldn't, you couldn't leave work in the day if you were you know, on a plantation. Other times you had the privacy of your ritual and, your, and what you did, what you knew from your homeland. So there were a variety of, of, of reasons why they were done. Um, the, the other one is a, a funeral, a Negro funeral in Virginia um, from 1880, and this was in the Harper's Weekly. And um, this is all comes from the Atlantic slave trade and slave life in America is a visual record. So this procession, procession, excuse me, is in South Island in 1950. South Island is Georgetown County. And if anybody's ever heard of the Yawkey Plantation, okay, so South Island is where that is. You have to take a boat to get over. There's a ferry and 
If you call in advance, you can actually take a free tour of, of it because it's now a foundation. Has anybody ever taken the tour here? I, I would recommend it. It's a very, very nice place. It's a small chapel. People get married over there sometimes. It's pretty interesting. So um, I just wanted to show you that just in terms of how people were, you know, dealing with going across the water in different Gullah Islands across the, you know, South Carolina in particular. So now I want to talk a little bit about intangible culture. What do I mean by that? Well, intangible cultures would be like your, your, your folk festivals, like your Gullah festival or your Greek festival. These are things, song and dance, you know, that's all what we call intangible culture. So in this particular one, I'm showing you this because this was a funeral. My cousin died last August, and we're at Wadmala Island. And the gentleman who's all dressed up in a hat, he lifted a song. And when he lifted the song, everybody jumped right in, and they just sang. And then he picked up the shovel, and he started putting that dirt on my cousin. And then when he got tired, the next man came. And, and they did that, these men and the women, everybody sang, but the men continued to do that until my cousin was buried. And this is tradition. This is tradition, you know. Community grave diggers, you know. Nobody's, people are not hiring people to come dig a grave. They, you know, you do it for your own. You do it for your own. Um, my work with young people, and I'm happy to see that we have some young people in the back. Thank you guys for coming. Um, Miss Viola Bryan is one of the people from, again, from Defusky. But why she's important is a couple of things. When we talk about education and how important it is to bring young people into our work, because the young people, they have to carry it on. You know, most of us are older now, and, you know, we can show, we can mentor, but it's the young people that have the energy and the curiosity to, to move forward with it. So I invite anybody that does not have a mentee that you consider getting a young person that you can be a mentor to. Um, so the field work that was encouraged here, um, Dr. Herman Blake, um, he was from Mount Vernon, New York, and he went to college um, at, at Santa Cruz. And while he was there, he sent these two young men that are in the photograph with Miss Bryan. He sent his students there, and they, they spent time with her on the island. So that was a way. This field work is a way of, of letting people get exposure. Um, I used to be an art teacher, and what I realized in working with young people is that what gets in our way is um, a lack of exposure. So I would do things like bring in blue corn chips, and they would say, Miss LaRoche, what you eating? And, you know, it was like, it's corn chips, you know, it's not Frito-Lays, check it out. And, you know, and they would like it. So, you know, exposure is so important, you know, because we, we get caught up in feeling like, you know, we have to have what we know. And, you know, you would, that does, that's not necessarily the case. So anyway, um, he brought these young people there. And um, Dr. Blake now is at MUSC. That's where he works now. And he also is the... Um, the head of the Gullah Geechee Corridor Commission. But again, these memories of intangible culture are our memories, the things that we re remember, the smell of our grandma's house, you know, the taste of her biscuits, the, you know, the sound of the bullfrogs. I go to New York now, it's like, I gotta get back to my bullfrogs. It's too crazy up here, you know? It's like, I don't want to walk through the subway and feel like I'm, like I'm going to pass out because it's too hot and I'm claustrophobic, you know? So, and those of you who have come from the north here or other places here, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. So, material culture here. Okay, so we're working with young people and we're working with students from the College of Charleston in, the, in those departments and also um, USC. So the students are mapping cemeteries, and we've worked with Marietta Burial Ground, which is a part of the Hopcourt Barony um, Plantation, um, Baruch's Place, which was um, adjacent to where my, parent, my grandparents lived. And then we find this um, clock. We find a clock on, on the grave. So we know it's a grave good. You know, People put a clock there. Remember I talked about the four moments of the sun? And this is Grove Cemetery on Daniel Island. 
Daniel Island has four cemeteries, three of which are African American. This particular one is on the marsh. There's water right in the back. Philip Simmons, the blacksmith, the famous blacksmith from Charleston, South Carolina, or actually was from Daniel Island. His grandparents are buried here. This is a stone's throw from the Daniel Island Stadium where the Williams sisters play tennis. When we go to clean up the cemetery, we find tennis balls all the time. <laughs> so this is Philip Simmons' grandfather. And this is in Georgetown, South Carolina. And I put this in because, again, it's this whole idea of ritual and, and, you know, and how we do things. So uh, again, I have to pay homage to another friend. I lost my dear friend Zelda Grant. And Zelda was an awesome fabric artist and another Gullah Geechee gal. And the bag that you see down here, that's Zelda's work. And I put that there because Zelda's with me here today. So she made this, this, this bag. Can everybody see it? If not, I'll hold it up later. Anyway, so Zelda passed away. And it was several months. And we lost her to breast cancer. And several months later, her younger cousin passed away. And she had um, the same thing that um, scardosis, what is it called? You know, that the comedian had. Benny Mac. Yeah, sarcoidosis. Thank you. And um, so they had a reunion, and they decided at the reunion that they would put, they would cremate them, and they would put their ash boxes in here. And this is their grandmother. Okay? So that's Elder, the artist. That's Gail, the actress. That's their ashes. This is their grandmother. Their grandmother was a missionary. She went to the, to the um, U.S. Virgin Islands all the time from Georgetown. So my other work with young people, I, been, I did a project um, almost two years ago now, the Gullah Book of the Dead. And what basically I did was I, f I identified six young people from sixth grade to, I think, 10th grade, and gave them all a camera. And we went to four cemeteries. And I, I didn't give any, any direction. I just said, just photograph what you like and what you see, OK? Then after we did the photography, we then went to the South Carolina room at the main branch library in Charleston. And they began the process of looking at archives. They looked at city directories. They looked at um, Civil War records. They looked at um, um, death certificates and birth certificates. And initially, the, the two, the, there, were, there were siblings, two sisters. Um, um, they lost their grandfather in the process. So that was pretty interesting. And then we had two sibling brothers. They had never ste step, stepped foot in a cemetery. And initially, they were afraid. We also went to the, one of the local gravestone makers. And we got a full tour. So they learned how that process took place. And they learned how they buried um, military and how it was different and you know the bronze and how they put photographs on the stones and so forth. So these are, these are photographs actually done by the young people. Isn't that an amazing photograph? I mean, we're talking about a sixth grader that did this. And you know, of course, I, I added a little change in the color. I made it more contrasty, because I really wanted you to see the lines and the shapes and the same stuff that this young person saw. So another young lady saw this, and, and they said, um, what does it mean for 44 years my faithful friend and servant. What does that mean? What did Mr. Witte, a German immigrant, mean when he said that Robert Dees was his faithful servant? Now, we know that's in the Bible, but is that what Mr. Dees meant? Well, we went to the library. We found the records for the Witte family. We found the records for Mr. Dees. And we even found, found um, some photographs. We also found some United States Colored Troop um, photographs because Gregory Lewis, Lewis Gregory, excuse me, who started the Baha'i Faith Movement in Charleston, his grandfather, I believe it was, and I may be wrong in this, was also one of the first South Carolina troops that fought for the Civil War. These are modern grave goods. So what do we see? We see a toothbrush, we see a cigarette lighter. 
modern grave goods. And then this is Morovia Cemetery. And what do we see? Oyster shells. And this person, they even wanted light at night. Isn't that amazing? They wanted light for their, their ancestor. I was like, wow, it's just amazing what people do for their loved ones. But look at this. What does this bring to mind? And I'll let you just think about that because there's so many ways you can take this image. And again, these were all taken by our young people. This is Chikora Plantation in Georgetown County. And these are enslaved people, former enslaved people. And you know, but that's a headstone. That's an amazing headstone, both of them. Um, I'm, I'm coming to an end shortly, and I do want to say that um, I'm really happy to hear that the State Museum is doing this exhibition on race, and I encourage everybody to go or participate, um, because our whole concept of race relations here is very different as it is in a lot of places in the world. It's very different. So in Barbados, they have a slave route now, just like we have the, the uh, Underground Railroad route. Well, they have a slave route. And the interesting thing about this is that they talk about Sweet Bottom, which they changed the name to Sweet Vale. Sweet Bottom was actually probated in 1777. It was in the will of Francis Butcher, and he gifted these five four-acre plots of land, and basically it was for his um, people that he was connected with, for um, particularly Sweet for the free slaves, hence the name Sweet Bottom. Okay, and it was the first um, oldest non-white village on the island. Boren's Land, on the other hand, is interesting because Boren's Land, this man granted to his slave mistress and their children 36 acres of land. Okay, so you know, we don't do those kind of things here in America. I'm not sure why or why not, but you know, it, it's an interesting concept of how we look at the history of the enslaved and their owners. Shrimpers, people by the ocean, whether it be in Barbados on an early morning day, and this is from just standing, me standing on a porch and just taking a picture, and whether it be them doing their thing, or whether it be the Defusky Oyster, Oyster Company, um, the sea is what has kept Gullah Geechee people. Um, again, my friend Miss Virginia said, we lived in the old village of Mount Pleasant. So we lived off of shrimp, shrimp, shrimp. But we had to get our vegetables and stuff from my grandma that lived in the country. They bought us what they grew. And we provided the fish and shrimp, or the fish and shrimp, right? Or scrimp, scrimp. Because you know, Gullah, we can't say shrimp. We say scrimp, scrimp. Okay, so the interesting thing about this oyster company is that they formed a union society in 1919. And they were so powerful that they even at one point had a strike and demanded more money, and they got it. Okay, they also were other benevolent organizations or fraternal organizations on the island. They had the Odd Fellows and they had the Knights of Pythias. But the Oyster Union Society outlived them all. They ended up buying, getting land, and um, they used the building for different functions and so forth. Georgetown County also has home large societies. And as a child going, I remember my grandmother used to go to this, this large, which was a praise house. Not a prayer house. It was a praise house. And my grandmother went there every, every night. And they were. And the floor would be bumping, and the mosquitoes, and the moths would be flying. It was like, wow, again, that immaterial, that, that intangible culture, you know, that, that experience of being a young child and, and seeing that. But that was also the home of the lodge. They had meetings every month. Everybody paid a due. And if you got burned out, the dues would help pay for you to get another house or to get whatever you needed. And it was a precursor to insurance. So this is what I do when I walk through the marshes of my homeland. I actually live in Murrell's Inlet when I'm not here in Columbia. 
I'm here temporarily doing this PhD thing, so I got about another year. But um, so this is some of my work, and um, I like line and color and and movement. And this particular one, one of my friends is here in the audience. We were we were hanging out, photographing, just hanging out. You know, she had never been to my part of the low country. I was like, come home with me for a weekend. And we had such a ball. Oh, I can taste those oysters, can't you? <laughs> so that's it. We have to go back and fetch it in order to go forward. Thank you. So questions. The first key. Yeah, that came up the other day. The first key is the first key. It's, I guess if you're coming north from the south, it's one of the first islands that you come to. Close, close kind of close to both Georgia and South Carolina. At one point, there, there was more energy focused towards the Savannah than it was towards the South Carolina part. But the South Carolina government, because it was a part of um, the county, like whenever they had a report that somebody had a distillery going on, an illegal distillery, they would call Sheriff McTeer from Buford. And Sheriff McTeer was a practicing voodoo artist, a white man. We're laughing, but I'm serious. He was a, pra a practitioner of the voodoo and arts. Someone else? Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. No, that's, I found that in a thrift store. And I just put it up there because it has the cowrie shells. So, you know, shells were important too. You notice the oyster shells, but also my grandmother always kept conch shells at the door. You know, um, horseshoes over the door. You know, my grandmother did it. My mother did it. I do it. My sons does it. You know, but horseshoes, not just in Gullah. But even in Europe, Europe, when you look around, you look at the history, horseshoes, good luck. But then you go back to Africa, iron, Ogun, the Orisha of iron, the blacksmith, powerful people. Blacksmith are powerful people in Africa. Yes, someone else. That it? No more questions? Okay, now. Okay, so you, you know how to reach me. I'm at USC. And um, if you think of anything else, and, and my book is for sale. They don't have any here, but the um, Arcadia book is still in print. You can get it on Amazon. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, have you seen our show, you know, the Fusky Memories, uh, and, and any particular one in there that spoke to you about some ritual or belief that might be, because we don't Um, you know, I was, um, I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking about her chapter on, on place, place, and um, certainly her cemetery work. Um, there's a, an image in particular of the cast iron um, graves. That's amazing when I saw those, you know. That was really amazing to see how they were, um, you know, kept. So that's, that stood out for me a lot, place and the whole, again, the um, mortuary practices. Someone else? OK, well, if you can think of anything else, you can always contact me at any time. Um, I have a website, gullagal.com. And um, that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>